Welcome to Dive Deep. I'm your host, Caleb Swartz. Our goal here at Dive Deep is transformation. As our minds are renewed by the Word of God, we aim to provide spiritually motivating and challenging conversation, which causes you to stop and think, what could God be calling me to, and how do I put it into action? We're glad to have you listening in as we kick off this new series, The Last 24. And Pastor Mike, thank you so much for joining us today in the conversation. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I'm just curious, as you were preparing um, for sharing about The Last Supper for this last weekend's message, what were some thoughts or some takeaways that you learned that maybe you didn't get a chance to share or weren't related in the weekend's message? I think some of the things that stuck out to me in prep that PA mentioned in his message, but uh, also stuck out to me just in prepar- preparation for the video, there's that word, <laughs> um, was how God's sovereignty shows up in the New Testament in what we've seen in the Old Testament. And what I mean by that is, So as I was reading about 30 pieces of silver, it shows up twice in the Old Testament. Once in what's given to the Israelites, that if a slave is gored by an ox, then the owner of that slave must remit 30 pieces of silver Mm -hmm. in recompense for the slave that's killed. Now, Jesus wasn't gored by an ox, but he was pierced by a spear and did take on the position of a slave. And so 30 pieces of silver... Right mm-hmm. there. Yeah. Then it, later on in Zechariah, where Zechariah is paid 30 pieces of silver for his work as a shepherd, mm. and God tells him to throw the money back into the temple so it can be given to the potter. Mm. In the New Testament, Judas, out of um, regret, throws his money in the temple, and the Pharisees say, well, we can't do anything with this money because it's blood money, but we can use it to buy the potter's field, which is where Judas hanged himself. And so you see these connections, and it's just so fascinating to see God's foreknowledge, his sovereignty, his plan, knowing full well what was going to come to be before time ever began, you know? Right. I think it's fascinating, too, as you um, identified just what happened with Judas and, and the Pharisees, Sadducees, that purchased the potter's field, right? Mm -hmm. It it reinforces just the fulfillment of prophecy and how God does tie it all together. Because, I mean, the the religious high-ups, they would have been working against or contrary to what Jesus was trying to accomplish. So I don't think they would have knowingly or willingly done something that would have tied their actions or Jesus' actions to Old Testament that would help make that connection that he's the Messiah. Does that make sense? Just on the claim that this could be a made-up religion or all these ties are false. Mm -hmm. Well, here you have an entire party that's working against Jesus, but they're doing exactly what mirrored or was foreshadowed in the Old Testament Mm -hmm. without their knowledge. Like God was working through, his providence was making this happen. Yeah, and it just, I mean, it speaks to like pride and humility Mm -hmm. because here you have these people who were by title close followers, you know, of, of the word of God. And yet there was this arrogance and pride that blinded their eyes from following the truth. And you hear Jesus say so often, he who has ears to hear, Mm -hmm. you know, and so, um, just really having a submissive spirit to what God wants to do, I think is key in those situations. And, And we can take those applications away to say, you know, how can I cast off pride and just be humble. And that was a big takeaway from Pastor Arley's message throughout the weekend. Yeah, absolutely. And so Pastor Arley did a great job of identifying the symbolism that was kind of strewn all throughout uh, what was happening in the in that last 24. Well, mm-hmm. we were just discussing kind of four hours. <laughs> right, <laughs> was right, right, right. The right. message covered. Right. Um, leading up to and during the Last Supper. And uh, of course, you had made some identification of it as well with the, with the silver and what happened with that. Mm-hmm. Um, But let's back up to kind of a 10,000-foot view. Mm -hmm. Sure. Why does God use so much symbolism through Scripture and in our practices? Well, I think, I mean, when we see those symbols, God wants our minds to be fixed on him. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think of what Paul wrote, you know, man is without excuse, you know, you look to Romans, um, to see 
God's invisible qualities mm. put before us. And so if you created something and you wanted a relationship with it, wouldn't you, and you loved it, mm -hmm. wouldn't you do everything to display your love mm. to your creation? Yeah. So when it comes to symbolism, um, it's an opportunity, I think, where our loving Heavenly Father desires for his creation to say, wow, dad, mm. that's awesome. You're awesome. And just the simple act of, uh, I was talking with a, another dad recently about the idea that, you know, it's great when your kids are like, yes, I'll be obedient. That's important and necessary. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, I'll do what you want and those types of things. And then there's this also this other dynamic when, when your kids say, I, I just want to be with you. I, I want to. I want you to include me, and and I'm going to include you. Mm -hmm. And this communion. I mean, back to the right. the beginning of the last twenty four. Not just in practice with bread and and, and wine or grape juice, but but communion of relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when there's that symbolism, there's opportunities for our hearts to be fertile soil, to say, "Wow, God, you are awesome, and thank you so much for making my heart aware." Mm -hmm of the qualities that you want to display to me because of who you are. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love it because you're right. Like he worked so hard to weave in and maybe it wasn't hard for him. Probably it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> right. For us, we work so hard to see it. Sure. Um, but he wove it into so much of what we can understand just to see, you know, I like to kind of call it God's fingerprints. Like, oh, here's mm -hmm. a fingerprint here. Oh, there's a fingerprint there. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, God's the God of order as well. And he makes yeah. order out of chaos. And so this timeline of chaotic relationships and people, and I mean, you peruse the Bible, it's it's not very orderly. Like people are messy. Mm -hmm. But yet God strings through these connections, these ties, these symbols all through Scripture, through these people's lives just to show like, Hey, I'm working here behind the scenes. Yeah. I'm moving things forward for you. So just a note to that, like uh, I, I think, and God's been guiding my heart on this lesson recently, like busyness can be the enemy of noticing God's work. Mm. What, yeah. what I mean by that is like if we move at such a pace thinking, I think underneath there's a bit of a subconscious like that we're so important that we need to keep a, a busy pace. And and obviously there's <laughs> external, you know, external things that vie for our time. And I'm not saying that we will eliminate those things. But if we're aware of how we can prioritize, like everyone, you're listening right now, you've prioritized time. Thanks for listening to Dive Deep for this time. And beyond that, do we cultivate and allow time to just observe and listen for the Lord to speak to us. Because if we move at such a pace where we're not really listening, mm. we're just kind of, you, you, we've all, you know, you know, the, the analogy of like you're in school and you speed read, or you just kind of skim over for the, the definition words, it's in bold, that type of a thing. But if you really soak it in, it takes time to do that. So like yeah. when we're talking about symbolism, are we allowing our hearts to be ready to receive what God has? And if we move at such a pace that the world says, you know, can all you get, get all you can, that type of thing, that will uh, kind of take away our focus. Yeah. From, I mean, we're going to have eternity to worship the Lord, so that's not busy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> There's a plan, obviously, yeah. but but in our day-to-day, -day, are we reflecting that? Yeah. One quick thought sure. um, before we transition back mm -hmm. on that idea of eternity and not being busy I think that is such a profound thought if we can wrap our heads around that, mm -hmm. that in eternity, we're going to have the opportunity to truly engage and experience all the good things that God is and has to offer us mm -hmm. without feeling rushed through it. Like right now, we tend to feel rushed. Mm -hmm. You know, we get those week vacations and it feels incredible because, you know, maybe there's no schedule or no agenda or you're able to schedule everything that you want to do and kind of follow this path and program and you know, you just feel really good about the time that you're spending because there's mm -hmm. no demands mm -hmm. on you. Mm -hmm. You just get to experience. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what eternity, I think, is going to be like. Mm -hmm. We can just experience it fully and be fully aware. Mm -hmm. As you're talking about slowing down and studying, so let's pivot back to that. Sure. So as you were slowing down and kind of studying for uh, these last four hours that we discussed, mm -hmm. was there something there that stuck out to you 
that you went, oh, wow, that's cool. I mean, maybe hadn't felt that fully before as I read it. Yeah. So, I mean, one thing that I hadn't realized, if you look in the Gospel of John, you see the timeline of the Last Supper and how Jesus washed all the disciples' feet, Mm -hmm. including Judas. Mm. And I I hadn't realized that before. Yeah. Now, for us, we can't read other people's minds. Um, Jesus knew Judas was going to betray him, so I th- he did the harder thing. He always does the harder thing, we, we're, <laughs> and I'm thankful for that. Right. But so Jesus washing r- really, in essence, his enemy, mm-hmm. his enemy's feet. Um, and even there's that, there's that little moment where he extends, he dips the bread, and he gives it to Judas. That's a symbol of friendship. Mm. That's a symbol of I'm for you. Judas, who's already put this evil plan into motion, watching for an opportunity to betray Jesus, accepts that bread, eats it, and then leaves. Mm. He accepts the symbol of friendship, and then he goes and does what he's about to do. And it's power. When you think about Jesus knowing Mm -hmm. that that happened, and right after Judas leaves, he talks to his disciples and says, I want you to love one another. This is a new command, the way I've loved you. Now, they don't know that Judas is going to betray Jesus, but they come to find out what happened later. Right. So reflecting on that, like... Do you think a part of that charge was Judas is going to do this? I'm not telling you, but Judas is going to betray you. You need to love him too. I I don't know. That's a good good thing to ponder. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, looking back, I mean, the persecution that the apostles faced... And looking back on what Jesus did and and then, you know, learning of what had happened to Christ because of Judas, it's just so powerful to think about how you love your enemies. Now, for us, a takeaway, I think, is like, mm-hmm. we don't read minds, but I think the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy. I don't think that's scripture, but I mean, because of what we find in scripture, the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy. One of those things is suspicion, mistrust, broken trust. Mm. So do we show love? to the people that we're suspicious of. Right. You know, obviously, yes, be discerning, but are we giving grace? Or mm-hmm. or do we withhold grace for the people that we think deserve it? Because then really it's not grace. Then it's like, hey, here's a paycheck, or you're not getting paid today. Yeah. Uh, I and mean, Judas is the one who got a paycheck. <laughs> yeah. And you make me think, as you as you phrase it that way, I mean, it's easy to think about uh, maybe people that we <laughs> don't get along well with and applying them into this context. But... Like, let's back up just a sec. What about that brother or sister that you know you haven't spoken to in five years, or that spouse that you know so well that you assume what their motive is, and you withhold that gentleness or forgiveness or grace because you think you know what their motivation is? Mm-hmm. And we can get trapped into these cycles with people that we know really well mm-hmm. and should love really well, but we don't. And and I think therein is an opportunity to look like Jesus. And the only person that's going to know about that is you and God. Right. But the power is, Lord, help me in my heart Mm -hmm. to live out through my mouth and my actions what you've done for me all along. Yeah. And so if if we're not holding fast and looking at Christ's example, we're just looking for paychecks, Mm. you know? And 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 is it thirty pieces of silver moments mm. where maybe maybe it's not? I mean, it's obviously not the exact same thing that Judas did. But are we betraying or undermining the cause of Christ because we're hanging on to ourselves? Ugh. <laughs> you know, it's like God help us. Yeah. You know, focus on the work of the cross. Be transformed by the renewing of our minds and let go of ourself and cling to Him. Yeah, and I love that idea. I mean, and so. We just we have to partner with God in doing this, right? Some of some of this responsibility of treating others differently is obviously on us. It's mm-hmm. our responsibility in how we act. Mm-hmm. But then at the same time, just as Jesus did this perfectly, like He's going to work inside of you, inside of me, mm-hmm. inside of us to help us live this way. Mm-hmm. So I just I hope people listening can grasp that that like. God does as much to change our hearts towards other people as we do to change our actions towards other people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's it's a partnership with him. But final thought? Yeah, I would say submit to the Lord and ask him to guide you uh, to the least of these. Love is messy. 
Mm. Love is dirty. Love cleans off the dirt of others. And so if there's someone in your life, maybe ask God, who are the people you want me to love? Like you've loved people, those that can't pay me back. Maybe those that got paid to stab me in the back, you know, Mm, Um, look for the people that you can love because that's the way Christ showed us love. And he called us to do the same. Mm. Well, thanks for your time today, Pastor Mike. Glad to be here. Thanks. And thanks for connecting with us on CWC Dive Deep. We want to answer the questions that are on your mind as you listen to the weekend's message. And we encourage you to submit those online at cwc.life slash dive deep. And if you've benefited from this podcast, then spread the word and tell others about it. And you can find us now on YouTube. And shout out to Amber Ferguson, who's been throwing down some comments on those YouTube videos. Join us next week as we continue our new series leading up to Easter. And if you've missed past episodes, check those out at cwc.life or on our YouTube channel. Have a great week.